Good evening, everyone. My name is Aliza Schulman, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Tricep Region. On behalf of my colleague, Alana Grauer, our Southeast Regional Associate and Madrasa Ala Alumni Liaison, we want to thank you for joining us for Amit's Tulip Winery Touring Tasting. Thank you to tonight's event committee, which did a phenomenal job in making this night such a success. Ubi and Brian Farbman, Annie and Sam Grauer, Shira Schwartz Jacobs and Jonathan Jacobs, Khani and Shimmy Klein, Sarit and Noam Konigsberg, Caroline and Marcelo Messer, Michelle and Elliot Pines, Jennifer Bernstein Platt and Jeffrey Platt, Brenda and Alan Pritzker. Thank you for your hard work and partnership. Tonight, we're going to taste delicious wine, learn about the winemaking process and discover why the Tulip Winery is so special and epitomizes Amit's dedication to inclusion. But before we do that, we want one of our amazing lay leaders, Jennifer Bernstein Platt to tell you a bit more about Amit and our mission. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Bernstein Platt and my husband Jeffrey and I are so excited to welcome you to this wonderful event. I don't wanna stand between anyone in their first sip of wine, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the real reason we are all here tonight, Amit. Amit is an educational network in Israel that educates more than 41,000 students in 104 schools who come from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds, different levels of religiosity, different abilities, and from all over the world. Amit's Jewish values, holistic educational philosophy, academic excellence, and 21st century approach to learning are the hallmarks of our core values. The goal is to level the playing field for all of our kids. Inclusion for all students is a cornerstone of Amit's mission, which aligns perfectly with TULIP's mission and ethos. Amit has 50 schools with inclusion programs with 2,100 students currently enrolled. I'm gonna pass it off to Alana to give you a glimpse into the dedication Amit has for these wonderful students and their wide ranging needs. Farvanim High School in Petah Tikva joined the Meet Network in 2010 and has an astounding bug group pass rate or matriculation rate of 90%. Like all Amit schools, Kfar Ganim is dedicated to providing an enriching education for all of its students. What makes Kfar Ganim special is that 20% of its student body, about 120 of the 600 students at the school are special needs. Each grade has a program for special education students and students on the autism spectrum, and they are fully integrated into the school community. All classes are treated as a unit. Every activity is carefully planned in order to include all students. The principal of Farganim is quick to point out how amazing it is to see the influence that the special needs kids have on the entire student body as a whole. For example, since volunteerism is very important at the school, the special needs students are able to find meaningful volunteer work serving as mentors and spiritual advisors for younger children in kindergarten. An incredible opportunity at Kfar Ganim is the Amy Haber Zichron Lavracha Heritage Scholarship Program. This program enables special needs students to participate in an educational trip to Poland to learn about the Holocaust, a rite of passage for all Israeli teens. It is a central teaching tool for Holocaust education and for these students, it carries with it a painful added layer of self-realization. The clip you're about to see conveys the deep impact the trip had on the principal and the students. תלמידים מהסוג הזה היו הראשונים שהנאצים עכשיו הם השמידו בשואה. הם היו יכולים להיות גם גרמנים, לאו דווקא יהודים. זאת התפיסה האמיתית של היהדות, תפיסה של חסד, תפיסה של ראוי שכל אדם יאמר בשבילי נברא העולם. אנחנו כבר בתוך המסע שכל כך הכיתי לו ושכל כך חששתי ממנו. כל יום שעובר אני חווה חוויות חדשות ביחד עם כל חבריי לכיתת התקשורת. ידוע על הכל שהנאצים חיסלו קודם את האנשים המוגבלים וחסרי היכולת. ואני, נתנאל נער מוגבל, עומד כאן בגאון על אדמת פולין, ביחד עם משלחת תלמידים מישראל. רוצה לומר לכם, גרמנים ארורים, I don't know about you, but seeing those clips convey the true impact of Amit more than anything we could ever say. Another inspiring opportunity we have is the Bar Mitzvah program between the Amit Hammer Boys School 
and the local, local low Tem special education school. The Hammer students provide mentorship and leadership to the low Tem boys in the months leading up to a special bar mitzvah ceremony held at the Amit Rehovot Synagogue. They help with their tefillin and practice going up to the Torah. They joyously participate in the bar mitzvah, singing and dancing as the parents of the low-time students watch with joy. The Amit students are devoted and committed to the entire process and are just as excited as the bar mitzvah boys at the ceremony marking the culmination of their initiative. Now that we know how important inclusion is to Amit, let's learn about Tulip and their mission. Okay, should we get started with the wine portion of our evening? Okay, make sure your wine is uncorked as we hand over to the mic to Tal Bendor all the way from Texas. We will be monitoring the chat, so put all your questions there and we'll get them answered by Tal. A little background on Tal before he starts. He serves, he serves as Tulip's US brand ambassador living in Texas. He was a captain in the IDF serving in the Nachal Brigade. After serving, he was looking for a way to integrate his love of wine with a social cause, sort of like all of us here tonight. And he found his way to the Tulip Winery. He has been with Tulip for six years and loves bringing the beauty, story, and taste of Tulip to the U.S. He is going to guide us through a tasting of three different wines tonight. Take it away, Tal. Okay, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tal. Um, before I'm going to elaborate a little bit more about our wines and our story, we have a little clip um, that uh, was made by uh, one of our partners in the winery. Amara Stoudemire, you probably know him as a former uh, Knicks player. He also played briefly in Israel. Um, he partnered up with a winery and he's uh, telling a little bit about, about a winery and the reason for that in this short clip you're gonna see right now. Israel is a very special place for me. I've become intimately familiar with the people and its culture. Everyone here knows me as Amari, the basketball player, but I have many other passions. One of them is wine. It's my passion that brought me here to this special place, Tulip Winery. Tulip is the first winery of its kind in the world. It is located in Kafar Tikva, a community for individuals with cognitive developmental disabilities. Tulu's founders wanted to make a high quality wine, but they also wanted to create a better society. So they established a winery that employs people with special needs from the community. The concept is to give them the opportunity to live a normal life like everybody else and to be a part of the wine industry. The wine that they are making is selling worldwide in Japan, in Russia, in Taiwan, in California. They feel satisfaction of what they are doing and that's worth everything for us. Our most aged wine will be the Black Tulip. This is our flagship wine, which won a lot of awards around the world. The label was drawn by a guy who has Down syndrome. His name is David Ashkenazi. We got thousands of drawings from thousands of children with disabilities. We chose this drawing because it's optimistic. And we call this competition Don't Label Me because we believe you can label wines, but you cannot label people. And this is how we walk in the winery every day. And this is why we employ people with disabilities. I'm pretty excited to be here. I just wanted to meet the people who make this miracle happen. Okay, so hi everybody. Again, that's me, Tal. I'm gonna be on your screen for a little bit in the next hour or so. Um, so briefly, uh, Abar Sotomayor uh, played in Israel, um, uh, played uh, basketball in one of the teams, and he has passion for wine, like a lot of us here in this Zoom. And he wanted to uh, make his own label. And he heard about the story of the winery, which we're gonna um, dive into it a little bit more um, in, in the next few minutes and he decided that he wants to be a part of this amazing thing that is called Tulip Winery. But before I'm going to dive in into that and into a lot of other wine information, I would like you to pour your first glass of the white wine. As you can see on the table map that you've got, 
first wine that you get a taste is the white tulip. Um, so uh, while you're pouring to your glass, I'll let you know a little bit about the wine itself. And so uh, white tulip is our own original plant. Um, tulip winery is the first winery in the world that utilized the, these two varieties together in the blend. In this case, Gewurz Treminer and Sauvignon Blanc, two very different grapes in their taste profile and their background uh, together alongside in this fine blend. Uh, it's a dry wine. Um, in uh, various uh, vintages, it's actually bone dry with no residual sugar in it whatsoever. Uh, when that happens, that's the wine that you can drink and have no headache the next day. Um, which is a nice, nice quality to it. Um, in this case, this wine shows uh, a lot of citrus notes that comes from the Sauvignon Blanc in it, and uh, lychee and some jasmine and floral flavors that comes from the Kibbutz Terminer. And while you're sipping and enjoying it, and I'm going to tell you what to pair it with later on, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you make a white wine. And so in front of you, you can see a nice infographic uh, that shows the nice uh, path, you know, nice path from vineyard to bottle. And um, mainly all white grapes are actually green. The majority are green grapes. Um, some of them are a little bit of pink, uh, but the essence is that every grape that grows in the vineyard can be a white wine. The only thing is, uh, if you want it to have, a, if you don't want it to be a white wine, you leave it with the skins, uh, during the winemaking production, and then the color is going to be a part of the wine. If it's a red grape, it's going to be more red. If it's a pink grape, like the Givort Cheminer in this wine, it's going to be more blushed. So for the most part, white wines are being uh, crushed and pressed together, separating the skins and the seeds from the fermenting juice. We let the juice settle a little bit uh, so it can be balanced. Uh, sometimes it's even being filtered a little bit before the fermentation starts. And then the fermentation happens when we, we add on yeast or culture yeast in that matter um, in order to generate the uh, alcoholic fermentation. That being said, uh, in Tulip, we actually, um, for the majority of our wines, we uh, utilize spontaneous fermentation that takes place um, with the ambient yeast, the yeast that are already on the grapes. Um, that way uh, we are getting results that um, are unique every year. Obviously, as uh, the winery that takes pride in the, in, in the quality of the wines, we make sure that each year the wine is getting better. But every grape on, in the vineyard and in the winery with, uh, where the grapes are coming into, um, has yeast on it. And in some places they use culture yeast that has uh, results that you can uh, uh, basically plan ahead. And we use the ambient one. Then the melolactic fermentation, which is mentioned here is uh, mainly on the heavy creamy white wines such as Chardonnay. We don't apply it in our white wines. Even in our very limited production Chardonnay, we use it more as a crisp, uh, very citrusy Chardonnay. Steer, uh, steer leaves, uh, that's uh, mainly in uh, that type of wines or in dessert wines, we don't utilize that process as well. That's, these are the dead yeast that sometimes are, st they, uh, are stayed in the bottle and then filtered out to give some uh, structure to the wine. And, um, and then at the end, they're, um, they're basically filtered out. That's mainly in champagne. And then blending. And so I'm going to talk about blending a little bit more when we're going to get to the red wine. Uh, but every wine, even if it does not say on the label that it is a blend, is in fact, at the end of it, a blend. And we'll get to it. And then right before bottling, we do clarification and fining. Uh, we bottle the wine and then uh, it goes to the market and to your glass. Um, and white tulip, the wine that you have, uh, in front of you right now um, is one of the oldest uh, wines that we make in the winery. Uh, very consistent with it. Um, it has a lot of uh, a lot of good medals and results worldwide. Um, every wine critic that evaluated this wine gave it more than ninety points, which is uh, makes it on the top five ten percent of wines in the world. Um, 
And as a result of that, we did something um, aside from the, the, the social story that we have in the winery uh, that I'm going to focus in. Uh, we do a lot of projects year round with a lot of different organizations in Israel. Uh, one great example for that is that we took the white tulip as the best selling white wine that we have. And then we uh, took the, actually, for some years, it was the next one you got this, which was uh, the Cabernet, to the Cabernet. And then we make another blend. And we partner up with Make-A-Wish in Israel. We bottle those wines uh, in labels that called Wishmakers. And every bottle on that project that we sell, the profits, 100% of the profits goes to Make-A-Wish, to grant wishes for kids in the, uh, in the foundation. The reason that we use um, the white tulip and the Cabernet, or every year the white tulip, Cabernet is, is changing from year to year, is that we choose our best-selling wines um, in order to make sure that uh, no matter what, we're going to go and see this project follow through. Um, and, and people understand that we do this because we intentionally wanted donate and contribute to society and it's not a marketing effort because this wine either way is going to be sold every year and that's that's the way to it um and then we can go on and while you're drinking this glass you can uh, you can finish it up while we're going to go and talk about red wines and so before we're going to dive in on production of red wines i would want to uh, focus a little bit about showing you um, where our vineyards are located in. And so you can see on the on the map in front of you uh, the different uh, different vineyards, the different regions of uh, wine production in Israel and the location of our, our own vineyards. So in the nice circle that you can see right next to Haifa, uh, you can see Tulip. That's where our production is in the village of Hope, Fartikva. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the village itself. Um, and then our vineyards are uh, spread in uh, most wine regions in Israel. We got vineyards in the Golan Heights, uh, in uh, um, Faryuval, and uh, a lot of... Uh, Faryuval is the very tip. It's, uh, you know, right in the very north. We got in the Upper Galilee. Uh, we got in the coastal area next to uh, Haifa and Zichon Yaakov. We got in the Juden Hills, um, and we got in the Juden Foothills. Um, we got um, we got for the most part uh, the whites that we produce. The whites that we produce comes from the Upper Galley, from Karen Ben Zimra, Ben Zimra Vineyard, in uh, rough rough translation. And the reds are spread out from the entire country. And then we can go to the, the first red one. Well, well, before you move on to the yeah. record, I have a, question. Um, I have a yeah. question submitted about the white. Mm -hmm. Somebody said while they are drinking that, what notes or flavors should they be looking for? Okay, that is that is a great question. I always, uh, I'm always, I, I like white wines, but I see the reds, you know, staring at me with the staring contest right here. Um, I want to drink from them as well. Um, so as I said, uh, when uh, we poured the wine, and so uh, the Givut Sauvignon Sauvignon Blanc blend here, uh, we the wine shows aromas of uh, grapefruit that comes from the Sauvignon Blanc, a little bit of um, herbaceous, the cut grass that comes from Sauvignon Blanc as well. Um, one aroma that is very noticeable because of the Givut Sauvignon is lychee uh, or lychee. Um, I, uh, for the past few years, I live here stateside, and I know that this fruit is not as common. Um, but the ones of you that are familiar, it is very, very noticeable in the wine. One other thing that you can taste um, is uh, ripe strawberries that are a part of this wine as well. They're, they're both on the nose and then on the palate. Um, when you... Uh, one thing that we're gonna to touch base a little bit more on the red wines is um, the different color that we have in the wine. And so this one is uh, yellowish um, because of the two grapes that uh, they do have more color than the average uh, white grape. Um, 
But the color is, is good. The wine is very vibrant and, and youthful. And it's very aromatic because of the Gibor Terminer. Um, one main thing that we, um, we always like to, to know about wines is, well, what, what should I eat with the wine? Not what they should drink with the food, right? We're wine people. And so um, this one uh, goes very good with uh, very delicate fish. Uh, we like eating, you know, with salmon that is uh, not overly uh, seasoned. And a lot of um, uh, same stem style seasoning of chicken, the very you know um, casual uh, cuisine, and it goes very good with um, with some funky cheeses as well. Um, I like to pair it with goat cheese um, and on its own, or uh, with a little bit of, uh, of vegetables around it, um, but mainly. What lifts this wine with the, the cuisine is the acidity of it that uh, brings out flavor. And so acidity in the wine is what makes us salivate. It's that stingly part um, that also uh, brings out all the flour, all the, uh, all the flavor buds in our mouth, it engaged them. And then even the very mildest cuisine will feel like something that is very seasoned. And that's why we would like to taste food that is a little bit more on the mild side uh, with this, this type of wine. And so, wine number one. Cheers, everybody. And then, Wendy, all, I already poured mine, so I'm, it's easy for me to just grab the next glass. Um, and so you see, I'm swirling the glass, not too much because I'm, uh, whenever I taste wine and I drink wine, I use uh, glasses that are 10 ounce glasses. That is the uh, um, benchmark for tasting wine in the industry. Um, I didn't know that until I started judging in wine competition. And then they started to give you all that uh, small glasses. And I said, okay, well, everybody's you know, cutting us off or something. And so, no, that is uh, that is how you taste wine. That funnels all the flavor and aroma through a very narrow gap that forces you to experience everything that it got. And so that is, is the, why- Is this the Cabernet that you're tasting now? Yes, yes. Wine number two is our Cabernet. It's the Tulip Cabernet 2019. Um, and that is the that is the current vintage in the market. Um, a while back, we uh, changed a little bit our uh, a little, few of the philosophies in the vineyard and in the in the winery itself, in both growing and making the wine. And so, usually, the um, the Tuli Cabernet used to be a hundred percent Cabernet Sauvignon, and a few years back, we decided to plant uh, Viognier and Carignan in new vineyards. And we start to implement it in this wine. So we have 90% of the Cabernet Sauvignon and then 5% Viognier and 5% Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, sorry, kind of Carignan, sorry. Uh, we do the same with our uh, same level Merlot. Um, in, in, implementing Viognier in the red wine is um, is very common in in France in the Southern Rhone. Uh, it gives a little bit of uh, a different taste profile, but in very small portions to a red wine, it gives a little bit of flavors that you would never get in a red, like um, like the flowers that we got, the white flowers that we got from the Gibbous Terminaire. Those are aromas that you will get from a Viognier as well. And the Carignan, first of all, Carignan is one of the better grapes in Israel. And we like its taste profile and it gives structure and earthiness to the wine. And that is why it's a part of this uh, mixture. Um, but while you let it um, breathe a little bit in the glass, uh, and we'll talk about the swirling in, in a little bit. I will explain to you where red wine production is 
a little bit different. And so, uh, as I said, uh, both white, well, we can make white wine from red grapes as well. We just need to separate the skins from the production. But in this case, we do uh, incorporate the skins for very long time in the production itself. So um, we first hand harvest, um, we hand harvest uh, all, of our, all of our grapes, both for the whites and for the reds. But in this case, uh, we also uh, use a conveyor belt in the winery itself and we hand select all the grapes that goes into production, verifying that they are healthy and, uh, and then they go in. Um, we first crush, we crush the grapes, get the juice, and for the fermentation, we keep the um, skins and the seeds a part of the fermentation. We Basically, it's aging on the skins. That's the term that everybody uses because uh, all the tannins, all the tannins in the wine comes from the skins and, and the seeds. And in red wine, tannins are a big thing. Um, we keep it throughout fermentation um, and then we press it out, separating them. Um, again, we use ambient yeast for the majority of our wines in the winery. But in case we decide to use cultured yeast, uh, that is one of the major things in kosher wine. And so we all hear, you know, we, we got a wine from kosher wine, right? And so um, kosher wine, one of the intersections that gets the wine to the, you know, to the um, last stop kosher is the yeast in, in the wine. So we know that um, one, one thing that used to be an issue was um, a kosher for Passover because yeast are also in production of beer. And then if you want to make a wine that is kosher and kosher for Passover, which everybody includes that in the process, you need to get your yeast from a factory or a lab that culture yeast just for wine. And so um, if we do use cultured yeast, it all, all comes from the same, uh, same place in Denmark. All the wineries, uh, all the kosher wineries used for the, for the same place in Denmark that's cultured just for wine. And then after the fermentation, we got uh, the sugar, that uh, usually uh, all of the vineyards, we harvest them at 25 bricks. Bricks is uh, sugar, uh, basically the sugar content in the grape that projects how much alcohol or sugar in turn the wine is going to have. And so um, in the ripeness level that a country like Israel produced, um, we harvest at 25 bricks, which gives us um, a nice, uh, nice structure with a very low amount of residual sugar and wine that is not super warm. That's term wine, warm is a wine that has uh, higher alcohol content. Uh, we, um, we used to have higher, uh, higher content and now we aim for mid-level 13 and a half, 14 in our wines. Uh, that way you don't go to sleep while drinking, you go to sleep after. So you finish your bottle. And so, um, and then that's, that, that's a fermentation. Then we got the second fermentation that is called malolactic fermentation. I talked about it briefly on the white wine because that's where it's actually, it's noticeable in white wine. And in Chardonnay, malolactic fermentation is uh, what gives the wine creaminess, uh, creamy flavors and buttery. Um, it is basically taking the citrusy, refreshing acid in the wine and converting it to a lactic um, acid that is those flavors, it's mainly to reduce the uh, sharp acidity. Oh. Well, Tal, I know you're talking about the acidity of this wine. You mentioned that it's a blend. Yes. Somebody wanted to know, can you repeat what it's a blend of? Okay, so this wine, so the term, the term blend in the labeling part of things, uh, we did mention that this wine is 90% Cabernet Sauvignon, 5% Carignan and 5% Viognier. Um, so it is blended with those uh, grapes, but this wine is considered as a varietal wine. Varietal wine 
in traditional wine making countries is a wine that is at least 85% of the same grape. And then the other 15% can be one grape or more, and it will still be considered as a Cabernet in this case. Um, it is blended in order to emphasize different flavors and to enrich the wine, give it more complexity. Um, but it is not considered as a blend. But as I, um, I said in the first one that I'm going to elaborate about that, so I'm jumping one uh, picture ahead. Um, we'll talk about the aging in a bit. Every wine is a blend. Um, it's either blending from different barrels because each, each barrel can consist only 250 liters, 450 liters, but you make more than that amount. So you're blending from different barrels that have the same grape that been in fermentation together, but then each barrel can generate um, different, um, different results. Sometimes little, sometimes big, but at the end you blend it together uh, for the end wine. And so um, in essence, everything, everything in wine production is, is a blend. And so if we go just a little bit back to aging, uh, we age our wine um, in, in barrels, in oak barrels. Um, for the majority of it, we use French oak barrels from four manufacturers. Uh, three from Bordeaux and one from Normandy. Um, and we use them, uh, they're customized to our needs. Uh, we, um, we basically, our winemaker, David, um, every time he uh, gives specification of how much uh, roasting time and what temperature he wants the barrel. Every barrel is roasted, you know, to carve, to make that uh, shape, to make the barrel but you need a little bit to make the carve and usually it's gonna be higher temperature to have more flavors that's gonna to impart to the wine. We use our barrels for five years, um, not more than three cycles within that five years and then we uh, retire them. Uh, we use the delicate wines in the first round, the more complex one on the second and the linear grape that has a very dominant taste profile um, very dominant grapes we use on the third cycle where they get the contrast from the harsh flavors that stay in the barrel. And that's on brief on, on the aging, um, that's on aging in the barrels. Um, and then if we have this Cabernet in our glass, um, there is a very, very known pairing of Cabernet in general when we uh, talk about food. And Obviously, I live in Texas. I'll, if everybody interested in why, I'll tell in the end. But here, everybody eats meat all the time. And then everybody pairs Cabernet um, with steak or with fatty meat. Um, and there is a very good reason for that. Um, Cabernet has high amount of uh, tannins. Tannins are those um, um, chemical compounds that there is in the wine that makes our mouth dry. It dries out the mouth, the acidity makes our mouth salivate. That's the beauty in wine, the balance between the two. But the fat in the food cuts through the tannin or the other way around. And that balance gives us an emphasis, it emphasizes the flavors of the meat itself. Um, one other thing is that Cabernet Sauvignon uh, is known as the most complex grape in the world of wine. There's more than 900 different notes, aromas, and flavors that are um, that are acceptable by wine experts around the world that you can get from a Cabernet. So in the world of wine, either way, when you say, oh, I taste something, you're probably going to be right because it's very personal. It's how we remember things, how we experience food and wine and uh, what taste we're known, uh, we know we know about. Uh, Israel is not big on raspberries and blueberries. Um, so ever since I moved to the U.S., I go every time I'm in H-E-P, I go through the fruit aisle and I smell the blueberries just to have that in my in my memory. So I know when I taste it in wine, I'll know to recognize it. Um, but it it go because of that, uh, it goes with a lot of uh, rich food. 
um, a lot of stews that have a lot of different vegetables, a lot of, you know, a lot of different flavors and spices, um, the, multiplica- multi- uh, the multi layers of the Cabernet, the complexity of flavors, both the earthy and the fruity flavors are um, contributing to, to those type of meals. And uh, they're, we say they cut through that dish. That is, that's how we say it. It, it goes well with those things as well. And, um, and so that was the, the Cabernet. Um, you were which, talking about the barrels and somebody had an excellent question, I guess, yes. in terms of sustainability. What is done with the retired barrels? So uh, in the past two years, um, or may, maybe more, uh, we expanded our um, outdoor area in the winery. And so from just a little planter here and there, our, um, our you know, that's, uh, I'll say the superintendent, the guy that runs everything over there, I, uh, his name is Faiz. Uh, he made a lot of furniture out of it. It looks amazing. But uh, for the most part, we, we just uh, sell it to people that want, uh, you know, barrels for decoration or, in some cases, um, you know, like uh, wineries that people, you know, open in their basement that they need the barrel that um, is not, because ex- just, just, you know, for reference, a regular barrel that we use cost about 1,100 euros. And that's before the, the cost of importing it to Israel. And so if somebody wants to uh, use, uh, you know, a, a new one, uh, it's going to be expensive. So they buy a used one for 200, 300 shekels, which is a very, very small portion of that initial price. Um, but that's basically where those barrels go. And then another question about, we had the map pulled up before. Does yes. Tulip own all of those vineyards where the grapes are sourced? That is a great question. And so in Israel, there is uh, maybe two, which are the biggest wineries that own their own vineyards. Um, the way it works in Israel, wineries, the good ones, and we, we well, you'll, you'll testify at the end after you taste all the wine, but I think we already covered it, that we produce good wines, to say the least. Um, we make uh, lease agreements with the owners of the vineyards, long-term lease, uh, in order to have control on the amount of grapes or vines that grow in the vineyard. Uh, Traditionally, the agreements were uh, based on quantity and then each uh, vintner farmer uh, grew enough for one agreement and then he went and made, uh, you know, made some uh, uh, arrangement with another winery and made double the amount that year. And the more fruit, the less of the quality, um, we work on a ratio that is the benchmark in the industry uh, that you may you grow no more than four metric tons per acre. In Israel, we use dunam. Dunam is a measuring uh, that is uh, one dunam is quarter of an acre, so we say one metric ton per dunam, uh, but it's four metric ton per acre. Um, but even with that, and that's something that we changed in the last seven years. You can achieve that with, uh, usually it used to be um, that uh, four metric ton from about eight to 12,000 vines. Very, sorry, not it, it used to be, um, sorry, less. It was uh, that from 1,000 vines. So each vine used to produce uh, all this converting. I'm still the metric. Um, and so 1,000 vines used to produce four kilos. And so uh, within that vast vineyard, um, they would, you know, each vine would produce a lot of grapes. And again, that's not too good. And so uh, we changed it to the point that each vine, uh, we replanted the vineyards and we spread it out. And now each vine is growing no more than one kilo. Um, one of the experts that are um, uh, basically for the last few years working very close with our winemaker, uh, he had, you know, he, show, he showed the, his idea by saying, um, when you have one kid, 
then you give him all of your love and all of your attention and he grows very good but when the second kid come around you love him as well but you can't split the focus between two people 100% and 100% so if you have just one bunch on the vine then everything that the vine can grow uh, all the the benefits from the ground all the nutrients go just to that one bunch and that makes that grapes way better than whatever you're going to do if it's going to be four or more and that is that is the divides themselves don't tell all the second children and second siblings in this zoom that but it'll just that's be okay I'm, I'm actually we're expecting uh our uh, we're expecting a daughter we have a one we have a son just had his first, second birthday a week ago and uh, we're expecting a daughter i hope she's going to be better than him he's good i love him but i know that she's going to take my attention because they always say that you know um that is girl and that is little princess and so i'm afraid of that i don't have enough money in the bank for that but <laughs> that's another thing um and so um putting this aside because uh, that's fun um and so that that was uh briefly on on um on aging and and the vineyards themselves um now we're going to go to wine number three um and so just a second that was the cabernet very good wine um but wine number three has a very, very unique story. So this is the tulip espero. Espero means hope in Esperanto. Esperanto was the international language that Zamenhof tried to form in the 1800s until everybody understood that there's already an international language that's English and it didn't, didn't lift off. Um, we call this wine espero because the village of hope. The village of hope is where our winery is located and this wine, the Sparrow, um, was released on our 10th anniversary in, in the winery. It was a special wine that we made for that uh, 10 years anniversary event. Um, and it is, it is a blend of uh, Syrah, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. Uh, this vintage that you have in your glass was aged for one year in French oak barrels. It was aged for six months, each variety on its own. And then the remaining six months, it was co-aged, co-aging all the three varietals together. Um, this is a type of aging that we started to implement in this wine, um, I think two vintages ago. Um, that is um, a method that is in use in some wine regions of the world. Uh, and we decided that we want to further explore that with this wine. Um, we, uh, we are happy with the result. It is, uh, it is showing beautifully. Um, you can, usually I, you know, I say, uh, when I say, talk about this wine, I say it's Cabernet Franc Syrah Merlot, because usually you say, the more the more dominant grape, I tend to say the more dominant grape on the taste profile. In my opinion, it's the Cabernet Franc, but um, on the actual uh, percentage, the Syrah is uh, the big big player on this wine. Um, the beautiful story about this wine um, is that we 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 did that event on our 20th anniversary because uh, we feel. Um, every day that uh, the, the employees from the village in the winery are like our family and we want to celebrate it all the time. Um, we today, Village of Hope have over 220 residents. Uh, adults with special needs are 20, 21 years old or older. Uh, they live in apartment with roommates um, and then they go to they go in the morning to eat breakfast together in the dining hall it's it's almost like a kibbutz it is on the remains of a kibbutz that was abandoned in the 50s so it has all that kibbutz facilities and then they go to work 
Um, the main employer in in the in the village is our winery. Uh, we have uh, ninety percent of our staff are uh, uh, people from the village um, residents that are on the spectrum, um, and they are a part of every aspect of the winery. Um, to me, when I started to work in the winery. Um, I went and started because I wanted to find something on the private sector that implements uh, social cause. And I have a background uh, in a special needs, special needs education. And I felt like I want to I want to be a part of this amazing thing. And when I got to the winery, I was I was I, I can say amazed, but how much they integrate in, in, in the day to day work. One main thing. And I like to use that uh, example because that shows how how big it is. And I see it here here in the U.S. You know, people with special needs when they are employed, they, they have tasks that you know, bagging groceries. That not that it's not important. It gives them a sense of purpose. But one of the employees from the village, his name is Dovi. His responsibility he is in charge of all the production facility, that all the surveillance cameras are operational, that all the doors are locked at the end of the day and in the beginning of the day. And why is it that important? So as I said, we are a kosher winery. If even one door is unlocked in the morning when the kosher supervisor steps in, or one camera was not covering its area, the entire production of 350,000 bottles goes to waste. And I don't know, there is a lot of people that I know and work with or worked in the past that I know that I'm, I trust them as much. And, and they are normative people. That is, that is a task that is very, very important. It has a lot of responsibility. And that's one of the things that we believe in in the winery, that we need to give them a sense of purpose. And not just check mark the box and say that we're doing something good. Actually, doing good is to act as they are, are ourselves, like they are us, and and that's gonna that's gonna work. And you know what? It is. Um, they do everything that we do, and it is amazing to see it every day. I used to live in Tel Aviv, which is an hour and twenty minutes drive. When everybody drive into Tel Aviv, I used to drive out of Tel Aviv into this amazing place. It's like time stops when you enter and you're in an entire different planet. And it is so fulfilling to see it. And because- I have a, I have yes. a couple of questions, Tal, yes. specifically about these wines that we've been discussing. Yes. Um, one question that I think is really great is from concept to on the shelf how long is the process to roll out a new wine from concept to the shelf was from concept like from oh this would be a good idea let's use these grapes this blend till it gets to the shelf how long is that process oh that's a good question um that question is uh, there is two ways to start that the answer is if you actually have those grapes planted then uh, one year until harvest, and then the production side of it is about, um, if you don't age it, then it's uh, three months, and then it's in the bottle and ready to go on the shelf. If you don't have the vines yet, and you need to plant them, it takes four years until you're allowed, in kosher wines, until you're allowed to uh, harvest grapes for wine production. Um, and so, uh, that adds a little bit of time to the production itself. But um, harvest is, in Israel is from mid-August until beginning of, or the end of October. And then um, fermentation takes about two weeks and all the process around it, filtration, fining, settling. And so um, it can be three months until it's bottled and then um, you need to convince the buyers that they want to have it on their shelves. Uh, that's another, another part of the, 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 the industry. So then once somebody's buying that bottle in the store, how long can they store that tulip wine, either in their wine fridge or in their wine dungeon? I don't know. 
we have some donors on here that have that, but how long can they store a bottle of tulip wine before it will um, turn for the worse? Okay, so um, there is a, it's not an actual rule of thumb in wines, but it does apply to our wines. So I'm going to use it and you can utilize it afterwards for uh, wines uh, in general. Um, wine that has not been aged in barrels is not cellar worthy. The aging in the barrel, the time in the barrel gives it longevity, gives it extra flavors that stays after the fruit flavors are broken down. That's what happens. Wine, when it's young, it's fresh. You got the fruit flavors. And then as years go by, uh, those flavors are disappearing, leaving a bigger stage to the flavors that comes from the barrel itself. So if there's no barrel flavors, there is no reason to sell the wine. The sparrow being aged for one year, um, we, um, we say that from what we know, and we make this wine well, for 10 years now. Um, and so we, we know that it gets to its peak uh, at about eight years. And we don't know how much it stays at its peak because um, we're just about that point right now. Um, but uh, it's about eight years because one year is equivalent to the amount of flavor uh, in this wine for, for that long term. The next wine that some of you have, the Syrah, gets to its peak at about 12 years. And our flagship wine, well, it is a Bordeaux blend that has a lot of it, you know, a lot of structure to it. Those wines around the world are usually at about 20 years. That's when they start talking. Uh, that being said, the beauty in Israeli wines that the fruit character is so good upon release that people usually don't have the patience to wait on the, selling the wine. A lot of people buy wine to sell them and then they open it for Passover. So um, they're, they're out of their own stock. Um, but that's, that's um, on, on that. The, main, the other thing is, uh, one thing that I've learned from our uh, winemaker, in wines that you are not certain what you're going to like about it, because you taste it right now. When you, you know, you, you taste the bottle at the winery or at the friend's house or in a, uh, you know, wedding, and then you know how it tastes now. And wines evolve in the bottle, and... You don't know if you're gonna like it more when it's fruity or you like it more when it's the flavors of the barrel. So usually um, you buy a few and you open one every year. And then when you get to the point that it's very good in your opinion, then that's when you need to drink the rest of them as well. Um, I tend um, to spread all my wine investments and in buying as many bottles as the winemaker promised that the wine gets to its peak. If he says that it gets to his peak at eight years, then I buy eight bottles and open one every year to see that uh, he was right. And then I'll be said of all the ones that I opened before they should. But um, every, I like the journey. Uh, I like to taste the different flavors. Um, one of the reasons uh, why I haven't instructed um, Elisa and Elana to tell you to uh, decant the wine is I... I believe in the process that the, the wine does in your glass. Decanting is opening the wine into a, a, a wider exposure to oxygen who generates the, um, the development in the glass or uh, the, the flavors. And so uh, if you pour the glass and you revisit it every few minutes, it's gonna taste different. And that's one of the, the beauty, beauties of, of wine and that is basically the essence of um, celery, the oxygen, oxygen that penetrates through the corks. And if you get, if you get a look at the corks, if you kept them uh, off the bottles, you'll see that uh, they're all different because each one is designed for um, different uh, shelf, shelf time. Um, the longer the wine is supposed to uh, cellar, the less oxygen uh, should penetrate um at every given time oxygen will penetrate that's that's how it works 
that's what makes the wine uh, evolve. Um, but then uh, different ratios. And then on the white wine, it's synthetic orcas. It should, should be fresh and vibrant and youthful. And you don't want any oxygen to um, tamper with it. So th um, there's actually a question about this in terms of um, all those fancy gadgets that are sold. And somebody asked if aerators really do help when you pour the wine in and it kind of aerates it and it's supposed to you know, fast forward the process of letting it breathe. Do you believe in those? And so, um, so the, all the process of aerating wine or decanting wine is to fast forward to what the artist, the winemaker intended you to drink when the wine is at its peak. Um, if let's say a wine, uh, if I told you there uh, are a sparrow have um, 10 years on it, then uh, you would probably need today to decant it for four or five hours. And then the amount of oxygen that uh, interacted with it will be equivalent to what would happen um, almost the same if the wine was actually at its peak. It is not the same because things do happen in the long term, but that's what uh, open it and makes it um, more drinkable and more um, elegant um, than how it is when you just open the bottle. Um, it softens the tannins, it mellows down the acidity, which both of them are essentially the, the fuel for long-term cellaring. Uh, the higher the, it is in the wine and balanced, has to be balanced. If it's not balanced, then it's not going to taste good. Um, and then the more they are there, the longer the wine going to cellar beautifully. Um, and then those are toned, those are toned down. Um, and the very massive fruit flavors also uh, evaporate a little bit. Uh, when you aerate the wine. So all those things are good. They just, the, and all those filters that people run the wine through, it filtered uh, sulfites or, which is, makes no sense because there is more sulfites on tomatoes and uh, fruit aisle or vegetables aisle. Um, but all those things also filter the good stuff. And so um, if you really want to enjoy the wine and learn about it and and see where it takes you, then the best way is to just immediately pour it to the amount of glasses that you're gonna share the wine with that day and let it decant in the glass. Give people the chance to taste it, how it is immediately when you open the bottle and how it is 10, 20, 30 minutes after if they're gonna keep it in the glass. Um, I'm, not, I'm not committing to 30 minutes for just one glass, but um, it is how you realize the actual uh, development the wine gets. And uh, so, in, in addition yeah. to what you're talking about and how the wine flavors develop, somebody had a question about the flavor of wine and whether it's possible that it could come from fruit that may have grown in the ground previously. It is, 100% is. Um, all the flavors that there is in wines, um, are aroma compounds. Those are chemical um, substances that there is in everything that we consume. Those uh, trigger different different memories that we have, um, and they and, and they also represent specific things. So that's one of the uh, very common aroma compounds. You get you have it in Cabernet, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Sauvignon Blanc. That's uh, furizines. Furizines. Um, generate aromas of um, bell peppers, fresh cut grass, uh, asparagus. Um, and, and so basically um, whenever different times of the year, let's say this uh, springtime when people cut their, their grass, then they'll notice that first when they taste the wine and have that. Um, but uh, those aroma compounds also comes from the whatever remains in the soil when a vineyard is uh, planted uh, after something else grew there. Um, same as the nutrients stay in the soil, there's the remains of um, a lot of other fruits or vegetables that grew there in the past. Uh, a lot of time it's on purpose. 
Um, there is a lot of uh, a lot of white wines, uh, white grapes that are planted on top of old strawberry fields to uh, increase that taste profile in wines, um, and it's a uh, very accurate, very accurate uh, thing. It, it happens a lot, and so one uh, one thing that I want to um, focus uh, on uh, before we get to some more questions. Um, and so uh, we also, some of you have the Syrah, which Syrah is um, a very, very good wine. It's uh, uh, it's 100% Syrah. Uh, it was aged for 14 months in French oak barrels. Our Syrah reserve uh, for three years in a row uh, gets uh, first well, gold medal in the fanciest Syrah competition in the world called um, Syrah de Moon. Uh, and that means that in um, the best place in Syrah wine in the Rhone Valley in France, they're coming a uh, uh, Israeli Syrah from a boutique winery that uh, takes first place and shows everybody there how you make an actual Syrah wine. It's 60% uh, of this wine is actually pre-sold before the wine even gets out of the barrel. And that is a very impressive thing. Um, very impressive thing on 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 the industry uh two things um that i want to touch base uh the, next to the wine that is for us is very important um is i have this bottle right here and lotan uh, on the video touched uh touched the, that subject uh, a little bit and i want to um say you know emphasize a little bit about it um we tried for a long time find a way how to incorporate our uh, our social cause with the wines that we produce. We did that, as I said, with the Wishmaker that uh, we bottled wines for that. Um, with our partnership with the Village of Hope, we did a version of a few of our wines that we call Tulip at Home. Um, the residents of the village uh, painted drawings of what home means to them and all the profits from those wines went to renovate their apartments in the village. Uh, and that was uh, so successful that we had um, to rebattle a second round upon release. Um, and we do that, pro that project uh, a lot. And then uh, the main, main thing is the Black Tulip. And Black Tulip is our flagship wine. Um, this wine is uh, just recently got 95 points um, from the Cantor magazine, which puts it on the top 1% of wine in the world, which is a very impressive. And it was on that neck of the woods for a long time. Uh, and we, we don't produce enough of this wine to do projects like we did with the others. And so we we found a way to implement that into our uh, social cause. Um, a lot of Israeli ambassadors use this wine in their embassies and a lot of people uh, with influence utilize it as well. And, and so that's why we decided to do the contest. It was, uh, it, it shows very briefly on the video, but it was a contest between four foundations for kids with different syndrome. And they need to draw tulips, uh, same of the name of the winery. Um, and that's uh, the winning drawing, as she said, was drawn by a 16 year old kid with Down syndrome. Um, his name is David. And ever since then, that's the label of our flagship wine. Um, same as the saying that we always emphasize, uh, you should label wine, but you can't label people. And if that drawing will uh, get people's attention in the table and they turn the bottle around and they can read it on the back label, that can make a lot more influence than what we do on every day in our winery, employing people with special needs. Um, and, and that is very important for us to the point that when uh, you saw a picture of David on, on, the, on, on the clip, when they announced he won, he thought he was so excited. He thought it was just, just that one bottle. And they, then they told him to turn around. And ones of you that's been in our winery the entire wall, display wall over there is all black tulip with the label. And he saw that and the amount of excitement he got, they, uh, David, our winemaker and Roy was next to him. And then Roy, Roy uh, our owner and CEO, 
promised him that as long as he is a part of the winery, that drawing will remain on our flagship wine. And here we are 10 years later, we actually rebranded our labels twice ever since, and it's still on it, um, beautiful as ever, and serving the very, very important uh, purpose of sharing our story with everybody and trying to make um, a little bit of change in every place this wine goes, trying to help people getting that spark to integrate people in their own community. Um, I yeah. saw actually it's all, it's so nice because it's such a recognizable um, label. Uh, it segues into my next question, which is my grocery store, my kosher wine store sells that wine. Um, and we had a question about that wine is recognizable. And so now that I know that story, that would be recognizable to me. But to somebody who's going into a um, wine store or into the wine section of their kosher market, and it could be a little overwhelming. Do you have any advice so that they pick the right wine and don't really look so um, wine unwise, but they really, is, should they go with a label they know? Should they go with a region they know? And okay, so I've, for the past few years, I wait, I call it, it's not wasting, but I waste a lot of time and money on wine education. And the one thing that I learn more and more is that um, in places that an area, a region is uh, incorporated, um, it, there is a benchmark. Uh, so now they're trying to do this in Israel with a few different areas, but it's still in, in you know, in baby steps on that. But in, in most areas of the world, uh, when you aim for a specific um, area, the, the flavor, uh, the quality is going to be at the, at the minimum benchmark that will justify naming it that way. Um, I, uh, I usually steer away from focusing on a specific grape because every winery can make, or even the same winery can take the same grape and uh, make it into a very bold wine, bold red, and you can make um, a blushed white wine. We actually have our white, uh, white Franc, uh, that's one of our white wine, is actually from Cabernet Franc, a very dominant flavor red grape that we kept the skins for only eight seconds. And it's just a little bit of a bronze color and it's delicious. It has red grape flavors and a white wine, something that no one expects. But to that point, um, I would go with a producer that I had good experience with. I would go with a certain area that is incorporated, um, but uh, you know, it's obviously there is grapes that it's, you would never, well, I'm not gonna say never, but uh, when it comes to grapes like Cabernet that are very traditional in a certain way, it might gonna be um, stronger on alcohol or, or less, but it's gonna be at around the same area. It's gonna, obviously different price points gonna bring you different quality. Um, but I would always look on on that point on the alcohol level and the region. And that's a nice uh, way to identify how this wine is being made. And that takes you, you need to know a little bit of geography for that. But um, a warm country, red grape will always either have high alcohol level or high residual sugar. And so if you look at the, an Israeli, um, Israeli Syrah, um, it's either going to be 14% and, at least and a little bit of residual sugar, or if it's going to be lower alcohol, it means you're going to have a lot of sugar in it. And so that's each person and it's his own palate and how he likes to experience the wine. Um, okay, and then I have not um, to that point about where the wine um, grapes are harvested. What is the oldest evidence of wine production in the world? Okay, so um, the oldest actual evidence of production and consumption of wine in the world is in Israel. Uh, we got uh, evidence of uh, um, ancient amphoras that have remains of wine in them. Um, that dates back to that time frame. 
And also we got um, ancient Gat. Gat is a wine press, how they used to produce wine that dates back to the days of King David and even before that. And on that note, um, I enjoyed our tasting today. And if anyone else has some more questions, I'll be happy to stay and answer. Thank you, and Tom. I hope you enjoy the wines. Thank you for that amazing lesson in wine and a glimpse into the world that is Tulip. We truly enjoyed tonight and hope all of you did as well. Thank you for supporting on me. But before we go, we want to let you know about two of our upcoming events. Please join us on March 14th for a Pesach cook-along with SD Adler Wolby on March 17th for the first episode of our Netflix and novel series featuring the Queen's Gambit. Also look out for a unique way to continue supporting a meat through your love of wine. Tal's gonna stay on. So everyone that would like to stay on and ask some questions is welcome to. We just wanted to officially end the program for those that would need to go to sleep or just continue drinking your wine. So thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed. We're gonna unmute everyone now, <laughs> pandemonium. Hey Tal, what's your favorite wine? I've been dying to ask. The last one. Yeah, well, so um, my my favorite um, my favorite wine uh, is actually one of tulip wines. Um, it's uh, it's black tulip. Uh, if I could drink it every day, I would do it. Um, but I don't get to drink it as much as I want because it's very scarce here in the stateside, and I I I don't. I don't distribute it myself. We have a distribution company and it's very limited everywhere. And so what I drink um, regularly or try to is our Syrah. Actually, we just talked about it um, yesterday, uh, last week on my son's birthday. That's, that's uh, I had a few of them, but that's what I shared with everybody. Um, I think it's a brilliant wine and uh, I'm a big fan of Syrah wines in general. Um, both from obviously our ours and uh, from um, from mainly uh, France, where it's, uh, it's supposed to be a prime. So uh, all of you that got the Syrah are very lucky. Alana, do we have any more questions? Any more good ones coming in? You're muted. Yeah, somebody wanted to know about if you have a recommendation for a book for somebody to learn more about kosher wine production. Um. So kosher wine production in, in, as, as, as a subject is actually not that vast. It's all the same as regular wine production. Uh, there is just few, uh, few different things that are in focus. Um, first, the people that make the wine, the, the, the people that handle the wine, that means from the second that the grapes are crushed until the bottle gets the capsule, the foil capsule on top, they on the uh, kosher supervisor, people that are uh, affiliated with uh, the organization that grants the kosher stamp, they are basically their employees of the winery. They're assistant winemakers, and they also uh, um, work as the supervisors. And th that's the human part of things. Uh, the physical part is that, or the, the material part is that uh, it has to be um, with kosher yeast, as, as we said. Um, has to be yeast that are only for wine because uh, otherwise it's not good for, for Passover and we all know that Passover is where everybody drinks wine. So it came to the point that it doesn't make sense to make wine that is not kosher for Passover. So today all kosher wine is uh, made to be uh, kosher for that as well. Um, and then uh, another aspect is uh, we haven't dived into it too much because uh, it's not, for me, it's interesting. Uh, but for a lot of people, it's just the boring part of the winemaking. Um, the fining, fining part before bottling, uh, when you filter the wine and you find the color. Um, and in wine production, in white wine, and in red wines, there is a few different materials that you would do it if you use, it, if you use actual materials or you can do it by surface uh, surface and gravity. If you do surface, then uh, you run it either through uh, egg whites 
which makes it kosher, but it is not going to be vegan friendly. And that's okay too. There is wines that are vegan friendly and they don't even do that. Or um, through gelatin. And then when it goes through gelatin, it's not kosher because gelatin has uh, unkosher matter in it. And so that is the two, that is the only actual material that is in use in wine that if if um, if it's implemented in it, it's not going to be kosher. And right. so we talked about the human factor, the people that needs to be a part of the handling of the wine, and then the material. Other than that, it's just winemaking. And then we have one uh, higher grade, which is the cooked or mebushel wine. And that is uh, when the grapes are pasteurized. Either the grapes or the juice is pasteurized, and that that makes it mevusha. Used to they used to make it um, in a very um, used to actually boil the wine to 55 Fahrenheit in the bottle. That was a very very long time ago. Today they just run it. Uh, they do flash pasteurization, run it through tubes, and just for in, not even a second, it just in high temperature and. Um, a lot of people think it's good for the wine do this way and actually implemented in a lot of high-end wineries in the world. Um, but it is... We actually easy. have a couple questions about the grapes. I just want to let you know. Yeah, okay. A, a uh, Knicks fan wants to know what kind of grapes Amari Stoudemire's wine uses. Okay. And so um, the Amari wines, uh, the, the, the series that we made, uh, he had um, uh, a Cabernet that is um, a higher, higher, um, higher level of this one. It was aged for a, a longer term, and it's uh, from um, the better rows of the vineyard. Um, then there was a blend that is um, close to the Sparrow, mm -hmm. uh, different percentage, and again longer time in the barrel. And then his um, flagship wine of that series was uh, same as the Black Tulip, but without the Cabernet Franc. So Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot and Petit Verdot. And it was aged for longer. Um, fruit was from the better rows of the vineyard, lower production, uh, and in turn, higher, higher price. So that's a lot of times that that is uh, a lot of people uh, ask what get, what makes uh, the price of wine. So a lot of times just by producing less bottles and utilizing less grapes from the vineyard or growing less, it makes it more expensive to make it, but at the same time higher quality and that would um, elevate the, the quality and the price of the wine. And then in, in lieu with that conversation with the grapes, Somebody wanted to know if certain grapes are better suited for Israel's climate and do some grapes just not grow the right way in Israel? So um, so the beauty of Israel, uh, if we saw on the map, um, I have a physical map here, but it's, it's going to be weird holding a map in front of the camera. Um, Israel is very, very diverse in the different wine regions. There is six general wine regions in Israel. Each one of them has different elevation, different soil type, different amount of rain throughout the season, and different aspects to the sun. Each one of those variables um, generates a different result, even with the same break. And for the most part, Israel is a warm country. Even in the moderated areas that are higher elevation, it is higher elevation that generates a colder climate from the warm that it is. Um, to my, again, that is my <coughs> um, halfway educated, I'm just you know underestimating, but um, to my opinion, there is a, a little bit of grapes um, that are not suitable for Israel, but in certain places you can make good wines out of it, but again, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be a pricier wine. You can force every grape on every place. It's gonna take a bigger effort and a bigger investment of the winery to make 
a decent wine, a, a decent wine from a grape that is not suitable and has a lot of investment to make a good wine from that same grape. So in my opinion, Pinot Noir is one of those grapes that is not showing very well in Israel. It needs an actual cold weather um, to be at its prime. Um, I haven't noticed a good quality Pinot that I can say, okay, it's better than other areas. Um, I did get a very good Syrah, very good Cabernet, a very good Merlot, a very good Cap Franc that I can say, okay, that's better than in a lot of other regions that pride themselves on those grapes. So that means that those grapes are doing good. And then um, I think there are also Sangiovese and uh, the classical uh, grapes, the Tempranillo, uh, those grapes are classic to a lot of regions in Europe, but they're not that common in, in Israel. Um, I think Carignan in Israel, which we, uh, you, you see the Maya label on the, on the screen, that's uh, another, um, another project of our winery. Uh, it's, a, it's a sister winery to Tulip that use mainly Mediterranean varieties and Carignan is a big player in that, those wines and it's showing beautiful, beautiful wines. Somebody asked if the if Tulip has a winery um, winery tours and a tasting room. I took the liberty of answering that yes, they do because I've been there, thankfully. Um, and then somebody else asked, when is a good time um, or season to visit the winery? Is there more action happening in different seasons? Uh, best time is tomorrow. Now that the skies are open again, <laughs> just grab a ticket and go and visit. They <laughs> they miss. <laughs> this the tour. I, whenever I, before I moved to the states, I used to take now the, the tasting room and visitor center is bigger. There's more tour oriented, but back then I used to uh, take all the um, uh, English speaking tours uh, and sometimes the German, but I, I'm not good at that. Um, and so, uh, but they they love it every time that uh, somebody comes in and speaks English, all the employees from the village are, you know, running towards and trying to, where you, where, where did you came from? And they're super intrigued from, you know, people that come from different parts of the world. Um, mainly, um, the tasting room is open every, every, every day of the week. We're closed on Shabbat because we're a kosher winery. Um, is there a specific uh, time of year that there's more happening at the winery? Um, well, so because we are a winery that um, that age wines uh, on multiple harvest years, and so there's always something in the barrel. There is always something happening. Obviously, uh, harvest time is super busy. Uh, that's mid mid August to the end of or mid October depends on the year. I always recommend to come in the morning if the winery is open. That's the time that, um, to me, visiting Tulip is more than just tasting wine. It uh, gets to meet the employees from the village. And the best time of the day is before they go to lunch. Because after lunch, some of them goes to their afternoon activities. And then you get to miss um, seeing and interacting with them. I have to say, I said that uh, every time that we watch the clip before we actually saw it today, every every time I see that clip, I have goosebumps. Uh, whenever I hear Donnie, that's the, the the employee that said it. There was subtitles. He said that every wine that you buy and, and drink, he makes here with his friends. And I have, because of COVID, I haven't got the chance to go and, and see them almost a year and a half. And I used to work with them every, every day. And these, you know, that's, I can't emphasize enough how, how much it gives them. Uh, one of the, one of the, the, the employees that is shown briefly on the, on the clip, um, his name is Aviv, or we call him Avivi. He is now, I think, 48. Uh, he started working in the winery when he was uh, 40 um, and mute. He never spoke a day in his life. 
And after five or after four or five years in the winery, he started speaking. And wow. And, and everybody, his parents, the, the, the counselors in the village, everybody was, obviously, we were in shock because we everybody thought it's a condition that the by, you know, uh, by pride, I don't know how to translate it, but his, of his uh, syndrome. But then just they figure out that he never had the reason to talk. He never had uh, any... Any, you know, any sense of responsibility or wanting to interact and, and by working in the winery and feeling like he is important and he, and he is, he got the courage and, and started talking. And yes, obviously after 40 years of not talking, his speech is, um, it, 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 you know, it takes him longer to generate sentences and well it takes me in English every now and then sometimes to generate a sentence <laughs> but um, it is an amazing amazing thing uh, there is there was a lot of you know pictures that chose uh, Nathan. Nathan Nathan is one of our um, one of our employees that is old he's older than everybody else he's in the age of Israel he's 70 he's about to be 73 uh, this year. And he was the first employee in, in, in the winery. And every time people come for a visit uh, from uh, groups of doctors or, you know, people that, um, donors for the village, um, they always go first and show him to everybody with his syndrome. And I always, I always forget what it is. And basically, it doesn't really matter what the name of the syndrome. People don't get to live past 55 and he's already 72. And the only reason that it, it happened is because he, he has a sense of purpose and, and he feels connected. In Israel, you can retire when you get to the age of 67. It's, you already can retire. And you always you know, joke with him and ask him, hey, Nathan, the, you don't want to go and retire. You can stay, stay in the village and come and visit us. You don't need to work. And his answer all the time is, what will the winery do without me? And it's, you know, it's not a pun. It's not a joke. He, he believes it. And you know what? I, I believe him. You know, he's, he's, he's what keeps us all going. You know, he's, he's like our own coach that goes around and makes sure that everybody is in their A game all the time. And, and that is, you know, to me, it is, you know, it's an amazing thing. Maybe maybe he's been there long enough that he would be able to answer this. But we have a question about where did the winery name Tulip come from? What? What the question? Why did they name the winery Tulip? Okay, so the family that founded Tulip Winery, it's hockey family. Um, they they always have a passion for wine. We always we always laugh that Roy Roy, the CEO and owner, uh they, he had his bar mitzvah trip to Bordeaux, um, but it's not a real thing, but, uh, you know, we always laugh <laughs> about it. Um, and so they're, they really like wine. And when they decided that they're going to open the winery, um, they sat down, all the family together, and tried to figure out what, what they're going to name it. Um, and obviously they say, okay, uh, it's hockey winery is not going to sell. It's, it's not a good name for a winery. And so they obviously, naturally, they drank some wine together. And the mom, the mother, raised the glass and said, okay, well, let's call it tulip. Because, well, that's a tulip glass. And all of us, for the most part, drink out of tulip-shaped glasses. And it just, just you know, made sense for everybody. And, oh, wow. Yeah. Sometimes it's just simple. Oh, yeah. um, we have another question. And then, then I think we might let you go. Um, how many bottles does Tulip make of each wine? And does that kind of determine price? Do they make less of the ones that are more expensive to like keep them a little bit more rare? And so um, it, there, is, um, there is an influence of quantity and the price point, but it's also uh, driven by... Um, there, in order to make the black tulip, you need to have a certain amount of quality 
and then grapes that are not in that quality are not gonna fit in that wine. And so obviously, if uh, we used to make 8,500 bottles a year of the black tulip, today we make uh, 12,000. Uh, we replanted our vineyards, uh, as I said, a few years back. That allowed us to have more grapes in that higher quality. Um, and so we naturally lowered the price. Um, Tulip is today, the current vintages are uh, on, on a different price range than it used to be on shelves because we made more bottles. So it, the cost, you know, spread out to more wine. Um, we produce a little bit over 300,000 bottles a year on our tulip wines. Um, obviously, um, the entry-level wines, we make more out of them. I don't know the exact numbers of uh, each of the wines, um, but for the most part, today we have, um, we got well, three, four, five white wines. We had five white wines. Uh, one, we produce a very small amount, less than 1,000 bottles a year, which is the Chardonnay. And then we got uh, the Sauvignon Blanc that does, the net Sauvignon Blanc that does not travel to the U.S. because it's also very limited production. We got the white tulip that we tasted today and the white franc that is brilliant wine. And then uh, out of the reds, we got uh, the Cabernet, the Merlot, uh, the Sparrow, the two reserves and the black tulip. And so um, the different series, yeah, the price is elevated because it, it takes higher quality of grapes. So we naturally have less of those. Sometimes it's the entire vineyard that is better than other uh, grapes. And then it goes to the premium wines. And sometimes in some of the wines, it's just a few rows out of, a specific vineyard that goes into that wine. Perfect. Thank you, Tal. I love that you went through the different types of wine you guys have so we can all be on the lookout and enjoy yeah. your tulip wines. Thank you sure. so much, everyone. We appreciate it. Enjoy your wine. Have a Chag Sameach. Enjoy your wine that you brought from Amit at your Seders. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Chag Sameach.